From Amsterdam, this is Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute, a treasure trove of the best and the brightest of American thinking. I'm Jonathan Gruber, and this episode's guest is Megan Tuohy, whose book about Harvey Weinstein's sexual abuse of women in Hollywood was also, as she put it, an X-ray into the abuse of power. These women had to turn over all evidence of what happened to them. They couldn't tell their family members. If they wanted to see a therapist, the therapist had to sign a confidentiality clause. And when a reporter came knocking, they would suffer financial penalties. The hashtag MeToo movement really got going after New York Times journalists Megan Tuohy and Jody Cantor published their investigative articles about Harvey Weinstein. They followed with their book, She Said, which dives deep, not just into Harvey Weinstein's decades-long sexual predation, but also the failures of the system that let it happen. Some have called, she said, the feminist, all the president's men. Back in 2019, Megan Tuohy gave the John Adams an interview that was almost like a crime procedural. She detailed how you piece together an investigation into someone powerful who was determined to undermine you every step of the way. It's a tale of harassment, spies, failures of the legal system, and ultimately, the triumphant power of the truth to actually make change. The Dutch journalist Joyce Rodnat interviewed Megan Tuohy in front of a packed audience at the University of Amsterdam, and she started with the most counterintuitive question. She asked, at the start of your investigation, did you even know who Harvey Weinstein was? You know, I actually, I will confess, I really did not know who Harvey Weinstein was. In fact, there was a moment several years before where I had um, received an award at the White House Correspondents' Dinner in Washington uh, and was sitting at a table next to a large man uh, who was receiving a lot of attention. There just seemed to be all the famous actors and actresses and uh, at least notable figures in the audience were kind of making a beeline up to his table to wait in line to talk to him. And I turned to somebody next to me and I said, who is this guy and uh, it was it was it was an actor and he said oh that's that's Harvey Weinstein and I said I don't I don't know who Harvey Weinstein is uh, I was really not a reporter who was steeped in the entertainment industry I had never covered it as we mentioned when we started this reporting I had no idea who I mean try, we didn't know any actresses I mean we didn't know how to get in touch with any of these people where we were really starting at zero but we were starting with a promise You know, there was something that happened between Trump's election and the launch of the Weinstein investigation. Our colleagues broke the story of Bill O'Reilly in the spring of 2017, and I know that that may now seem that like that was a hundred sexual harassment stories ago, um, but at the time it was actually a really big deal. Our colleagues showed, ultimately were able to show in the pages of the New York Times that Bill O'Reilly, the most famous and powerful media figure in conservative media, he and Fox News had ultimately paid off more than $40 million to women who had come forward with allegations of sexual misconduct against him. And when that story was published, listen, it wasn't, Fox knew what was going on. His employer knew what was going on. They were involved in some of the payoffs. But what happened when those allegations were printed in the pages of the New York Times was truly remarkable. Advertisers revolted at Fox. Basically, they said, we're going to yank our advertising money if you allow this guy to stay on air. So Bill O'Reilly was ousted from his job. I mean, he had been, and something that nobody thought would ever happen. And we at the New York Times took notice of that and asked what may now seem like a really quaint question, which was, you know, are there other powerful men who have abused women and covered their tracks? And so that was the launch. That was, and, and Harvey Weinstein had long been rumored, um, at least people who knew him, um, had long been aware of these rumors about him preying on actresses. And so we at the New York Times took this moment to say, okay, we're going to throw some resources, not just at reporting on Harvey Weinstein. We had reporters who were going into Silicon Valley, who were going into the restaurant industry, who were going into academia, who were going into car factories in Chicago. We really, in 2017, made a broad commitment to covering sexual harassment, not really knowing how any of the stories were going to pan out. Who also did Bill Cosby, the New York Mm -hmm. Times, Mm -hmm. the the huge... 
showing of all the faces of women yeah. who had been uh, abused. Yeah, the, our, our colleagues at New York Magazine had done that memorable cover. But you're right. There were listen. There were some signs. There was the there were some signs that things might be shifting. And you know, even with Trump, even after he was elected, yes, he was elected. But there were also thousands and thousands of people who took to the streets on inauguration with their pink hats, their pink yeah. pussy hats, to protest. Basically, out in the streets saying, "No, we do care about this issue. It is important. This is not acceptable." So we did. The stage was starting to be set. Okay, um, so you started. Wait, yeah, that's and, right. And what then? I mean, you don't know any actresses. You don't know who Harvey Weinstein is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how did you start? Yeah, so we started with um, our first secret source with was the actress Rose McGowan. Uh, she had, in 2016, as women who were coming forward with allegations against Trump, she was among the women who came who basically went on social media and she wrote a tweet in which she basically described being allegedly raped by a powerful producer. And she didn't name Harvey Weinstein, but there was a sense that that's who she was talking about. And so, you know, Jody, I was on maternity leave, but Jody reached out to Rose McGowan and at first she refused to talk. She said, you work for a sexist newspaper. I'm not going to, you know, there's no way I'm going to talk to you guys. Um, but she, you know, she did in fact open up and it was the first, she was the first source to tell her story off the record um, of being preyed upon by Weinstein in a hotel room when she was starting off um, in the early 90s. And uh, within a couple, within like the next month or so, Gwyneth Paltrow and Ashley Judd were telling very similar stories themselves. And these were three women who, three very different actresses, they didn't know each other, they weren't friends. And that was, and these hushed secret conversations with those three actresses were the first indications that there was a there there and a story to pursue. But even as this whole other category of victims came into view, we also realized that many of these women were legally prohibited from speaking to us. So, you know, which, this. Which means they, they got an amount of money providing they would never speak about it. Right. So this happens, and this happens in sexual harassment and sexual assault cases every single day. Women will after they've sort of experienced a violation, they will go to an attorney seeking advice because they want to do something about it. They want to hold that person accountable. And oftentimes they are told that their best, if not only option, is to accept money in exchange for silence. And why do lawyers do that? Well, I, listen, I think that what the lawyers will tell you is that, listen, if you want to go to court, if you want to file a public complaint and go into the court system, that's going to be a really long road and there's no guarantee guarantee that you're going to win. And along the way, you're going to have to open yourself up to attack by the perpetrator who's likely going to go to great lengths to smear you. And if you want privacy, if you want this thing to go away, if you want to receive financial recompense for what's happened to you, the best thing to do is to accept this money in exchange for silence. And we sort of knew the vague, you know, we knew the outlines of some of these secret settlements. We weren't shocked, completely shocked that there had been secret settlements that had paid. But as we did our reporting, the restrictive clauses that we encountered made our jaws drop. So, for example, I told you the story about the sort of patient zero of the Weinstein investigation, this woman who in 1990 had been allegedly sexually assaulted by Weinstein and then silenced through a secret settlement and had disappeared from the entertainment industry, never to emerge again, who had n and it had never spoken out about it. Well, there were other women that we, that were starting to come into view. There were other women who had worked in his companies, you know, just six or seven years later, who had been silenced through secret settlements following very troubling encounters in hotel rooms. And when we started to basically see some of the restrictive clauses, these women had to turn over all evidence of what happened to them. They couldn't tell their colleagues about what had happened. They couldn't tell their family members. If they wanted to see a therapist, the therapist had to sign a confidentiality clause. And when a reporter came knocking, you know, they would suffer financial penalties I mean, if they told the truth about what had many happened. Many times to them. they couldn't have the, the, the paperwork. Yeah. So, they what do you do? The, you, you are a reporter, mm -hmm. you want witnesses, victims, but, and they have been bought off. And they don't have even have mm -hmm. their paperwork. They don't even, right, they don't even, right, they don't even have the papers. And there was, you know, in the case of the woman from 1990, you know, she was, 
you know, she was terrified to speak out. And there was another, one of these other women, Jody went, actually traveled out to California. She got on an airplane and went to California to try to track her down. And she showed up in the driveway of this woman's house. And the woman wasn't there, but her husband was there. And so Jody starts talking to him and saying, I'm from the New York Times. We are working on this story about Harvey and West. Harvey Weinstein, I have reason to believe that your wife may have been victimized by him. And, she, and he said, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. And she's thinking, well, this sounds like, this is basically sounds like something that somebody would say as part of a settlement. And, and you know, so she kept talking. She's like, I have reason to believe that she may have, your wife may have been paid a settlement. And the man gestured to the house behind him and said, do I look like somebody whose wife just received, you know, has received a big settlement? And Jody is listening to him talk, and it's starting to dawn on her, oh my God, he doesn't know. This woman's own husband does not know what happened to her when she was just starting her career. Still, you want to write, you want to report. What do you do? Mm -hmm. How do you make victims talk to you? Mm -hmm. And in the end, even on the record. Yeah. Well, what we realized... What we realized early on, so there's two things that happen. There's kind of two phases of investigative reporting. There's the determining whether or not there's a there there, if there's a story to pursue. You're kind of selling your editors on the idea, like you're asking them to give you time and resources, sort of promising that it's going to be worth their while. And along the way, you have to check in. You kind of have to report back on what you found. And, you know, two and a half, three months into the investigation, our editor, Rebecca Corbett, took Jody and I out for drinks one night in Midtown Manhattan, and we spelled out for her everything we knew. We were like, we were talking to all these actresses. They're telling us the exact same stories. Uh, there's a real pattern of predation that's coming into focus. We think he's paid off all these settlements. And she said, how many women are on the record? And we said, none. And she said, how, you know, how many of these settlements have you been able to prove or nail down or obtain records for? And we said, none. And she said, well, you don't have a publishable story. No. And so we realized that we were not going to, it was a real wake up call for us. We realized, I think we had had this, you know, as I mentioned, we had had this kind of hope that at some point all of these actresses would join hands and say, okay, we're going to make this leap together. And we realized as we went on that that was not going to happen. Um, you know, there was one day where we drove, we, where Jody and I drove out to Gwyneth Paltrow's house. She'd been telling us her story by phone, and now we were talking to her in person. And we re were really hoping that she was going to get ready to go on the record with us. And you know, she had even been helping us in other ways. She was calling around to other women in Hollywood to see if they had stories for us. At one point, when we were sitting in her backyard, she stepped away to take a phone from another famous actress to say, you know, do you have uh, Harvey Weinstein story. I've got a couple of reporters here in my backyard, and um, you know they. The, and so she was really. You could tell that she cared. You could tell that she was invested. But even in that afternoon, in her you know sort of Nobody. sunny backyard, she said, "I'm you know I don't I you know I can't be the only one." Nobody wanted to do make the leap by themselves, and understandably so. So we realized midway through the summer that if we waited around, we were never going to be able to publish the story if we were just waiting for women to go on the record. Oh, and that's when we went in pursuit of the financial. That's when we really started to like dig in our heels and try to and started to work to nail down the financial trail of payoffs. We had learned from the, you know our colleagues who had broke the Bill O'Reilly story. It used to be, as a reporter, if you, were, you know, if you were wading into a particular subject and you came across these secret settlements, it was like a sign to pack up your bag and go home. You'd say, like, okay, there's, I, this, is, I, this, is, this is an insurmountable challenge. I'm not going to be able to do this story. Case closed. But what our colleagues had shown in the Bill O'Reilly story was that these secret settlements that had long been used to cover up misconduct, if you could basically piece together the financial trail of those payoffs, it could help illuminate misconduct. You know, readers weren't, didn't have to... Didn't, didn't, there wasn't really any question once they saw that the, the, that O'Reilly had paid off so many of these secret settlements over the years. So we set about trying to piece together the financial trail in, in the case of Weinstein. So you had to have proof. That's, we had to have proof, yes. Yes. And still you, you had to have witnesses, victims, talking to you. Mm -hmm. How did you convince them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to talk to you? Yeah, it, w it was not easy. Listen, when you show up on the doorstep of somebody in, to... to that, that was the strategy, just show up. No, sometimes it was. That, that's actually the strategy of last resort. Before we show up on somebody's doorstep unannounced, we're going to be reaching out by phone, 
by email, sometimes through family members or friends or trusted colleagues. And so, but we, listen, there's so many reasons not to talk to a reporter. Uh, when we came knocking either by phone or literally um, on somebody's doorstep, we understood that we were a often asking these people to open up about the most painful experience in their life. And even the powerful actresses were terrified of Harvey Weinstein. His power and influence was so great that they were, that they would be the ones to suffer damage to their careers if they spoke out. And so, and you know, they had done nothing wrong to become victims of sexual harassment and sexual abuse. They had basically shown up to work with like big work, you know, professional ambitions. And that's what they were guilty of. And yet they were, so, you know, there was also, it, it, in some ways, it even feels unfair that we have to ask these women to like go out on a limb and put themselves and take yet another risk to do this yet, work. Yet you made them. You so we would make, and yet we would, so the case that we had made was to say, listen, we can't change what's happened to you, but if you work with us and we're able to publish the truth, we might be able to protect other people. We might be able to turn your private pain towards some constructive public use. And I think that that really clicked for a lot of people. When we first started our Weinstein investigation, we thought that we were kind of doing like a historical corrective, what really happened behind the scenes about, you know, of these Oscar winning movies in the 1990s. But as our investigation went on, we started to realize that Weinstein was engaging in alleged predation, sometimes at the same exact same hotel as he had in the 1990s, as recently as 2000. 15. Um, you know, there ended up being um, a deep throat figure in our investigation. Yes, tell, tell, tell us about him. Yeah, Harvey Weinstein's corporate accountant of 30 years, Erwin Ryder, was somebody who in 2014 and 2015, as he was watching the Bill O'Reilly, excuse me, as he was watching the Bill Cosby story unfold, started to think, oh my God, I think we may have a Bill Cosby problem here at the Weinstein Company. And so he was, and he was concerned, he tried to do something about it, he tried to confront Weinstein. He tried to slip information to members of the board, the company's board, but all of his efforts to hold Weinstein accountable failed. And so when we came knocking in 2017, he made the choice to basically ultimately slip us internal company records in which women at the company as recently as 2015 were documenting serious allegations of sexual harassment harassment and abuse by Weinstein. And so that was the moment when we got those internal records where we thought, oh my goodness, this, the, the moral stakes of this investigation have just shot through the roof. Where this isn't a his, just a historical corrective. You know, this is somebody who seems to be continuing to harm people. And if we're not able to publish the truth, he's very likely going to go on to harm more people. So when we came back to women, to you know, we'd been talking, having these hushed conversations with sources for months. And once we got that internal com those internal company records, and once we had, at that point, we were starting to realize that Weinstein had made as many as 12 secret settlements, stretching from 1990 to 2015, we went back to these people and said, listen, you know, the stakes of this investigation have gotten higher. You know, we're not just asking you to go on the record to, to explain what happened to you all these years ago. Um, we are really working to bring to light what who we now consider to be an active sexual predator. You, were, you are a reporter, but you're also a human being. So how, how emotionally involved did you get? Mm -hmm. I mean, did you <clears throat> ever cry? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, have I cried in the course of, of reporting? Uh, yes, I have, I will, uh, I will admit. And of course this is emotional. Of course this work is emotional. And, you know, Jody and I wouldn't be reporting on these issues of sexual harassment or sexual assault if we didn't really care about them. And we have worked with so many, we have now, you know, sort of three years in, um, sat down at tables like this with so many women who have opened up to us about these really painful experiences. And so while we have, of course, been moved by those stories, um, we also have worked to maintain um, a professional relationship and distance. I mean, we are not, we always stress that we are not 
you know, we are not these women's friends. We are not their therapists. We are not their advocates. We are journalists, and we often feel like the best thing that we can do to help, um, as we've sort of waded into this river of pain, that the best thing that we can do is to do our jobs as journalists well. And what that looks like is saying, okay, we're not just going to listen to your story here um, and, and, and get emotional about it, but we're going to go out and we're going to seek our corroboration. We're going to do other types of due diligence to make sure that your story is as airtight as possible. And we're going to also be continue. We're also going to be out there accumulating um, and working to obtain other evidence, a whole mountain of evidence, so that if you do decide to go on the record, you're going to be doing this in a like in an airtight, extremely solid story. That's what we can bring to the table. He tried to telephone your uh, editor in chief several mm -hmm. times mm -hmm. because they knew each other. Right. Why? Yeah. So this is one of the things that Harvey Weinstein had done time and time again. I think at other news organizations. And so when we were working with sources, there, we were sometimes talking to sources who had spoken to other reporters. They had actually found the courage to work with other reporters only to see those stories killed. And so they they were pretty they were pretty upset about that. And they they would say, listen, why should I talk to you? Why should I have faith that this story is ever going to be published, even if you are able to get the you know, get to the bottom of the truth here. And, you know, what we would say is, listen, we can't tell you what's happened in other news organizations, but, you know, if, like, the only thing that the only thing that's going to get killed here is us if we don't come back with the goods. Like our editors are going to be very upset. They put a lot of effort and resources into this investigation. We have the support all the way up through the top. But that doesn't mean that Harvey Weinstein didn't try to go that route. I mean, he was very used to kind of marching into the top office or you know the the boss's 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 boss and saying, let's have a sort of a, a, a conversation, important man to important man, and Going but like I'm just, yeah, you know, and and he did try to do that with the publisher of the New York Times. He did try to do that with the executive editor, and it's worth noting not only was he sort of powerful and and intimidating and bullying, but he also was an advertiser of the New York Times. He he had spent his companies had spent a lot of money on advertising and the New York Times. But they're, to their credit, the the publisher um, Arthur Sulzberger and the executive editor Dean Baquet did not take his calls. They basically said, "Listen, you know, we don't have any time to talk to you, Harvey. If you want to talk to anybody, talk to the reporters." So he talked to you. And to Joe. Right. So ultimately, he talked to us at the very end. We really worked hard to, to, we did not want to, we were really reluctant to engage with him. We didn't, we made a pretty fast rule at the beginning of our investigation that we would not talk to Harvey Weinstein off the record. We suspected, we, we knew that he was probably engaged in a variety of underhanded tactics to try to stop us. Uh, we didn't know that it included these, you know, former Israeli intelligence yeah. officials, um, but we suspected that there was, you know, there had been a moment where Dean Bakay had pulled us into his office and said, assume you're being trailed by private investigators, talk like every conversation is being recorded. Um, so we knew, we knew that we had to really be on the, on, on the lookout for any sort of underhanded tactics that he was going to use. So we didn't want to engage with him in off-the-record conversations because we knew that he was just going to abuse that privilege and try to probably smear the women or do other things that would put us in a difficult position. But when, at the end of our, you know, at the end of our reporting, as part of the final due diligence you do in an investigation like that, you have to go to the subject. Um, you have to give them adequate time. You have to spell out everything that you're preparing to publish about them. You have to give them adequate time to respond to every single thing that you're intending to say about them. You do that. You do that in the name of fairness. You do that in the name of accuracy. And for us, that really set off. We gave Weinstein 48 hours to respond. And that really set off probably the most dramatic 48 hours of the entire investigation because two things happened. One, all of our sources, all of the, especially the name sources, were sitting ducks for 48 hours. So we knew that Harvey Weinstein was likely going to try to come after, and his enablers were going to try to come after those people. We also knew that he was going to try to come after us, and sure enough, you know, he, his high-priced lawyers came in and they threatened to sue us. We now know that these private investigators were also working on his behalf to try to stop us. And the day before the st story was published, we got a call from one of his lawyers saying, Harvey Weinstein's on his way to the New York Times. He'll be there in five minutes. 
And we said, uh, well, I'm sorry, Harvey Weinstein's on his way to the New York Times right now, uninvited. Um, and we had to debate whether or not to, to take the meeting. We had been at that point just engaging with him and his lawyers on telephone calls. And so Jody and I took a second and you know, de debated what to do. And I said, you know, I'll take this meeting. Um, I, you know, at this point, Harvey Weinstein was showing us who he was and what he was made of. And sure enough, when he came into the New York Times, he had that famous feminist attorney, Lisa Bloom, by his yeah. side. He had another famous feminist attorney by his side and another extremely powerful defense attorney. He did have folders of information about some of the women who were going to be in our story, information from their backgrounds, photos of them that he thought could be used to undermine them and their credibility. And so anyway, they, he came in and I took him, I escorted him into the, basically the middle of the newsroom, into a big glass, actually a small glass conference room, so that everybody who was walking by in the Good newsroom could you. see these guys. And I said, you've got 15 minutes, not a minute more. And I listened to them politely. And one of the reasons that I took this meeting is I, you know, I was like, listen, you're showing us what you're made of. Well, I want you to see what we're made of. I want you to come in here and sit down toe to toe with us and see that we're not going to be intimidated, we're not going to be bullied, and we're not going to fall for these smear tactics. And weren't you intimidated? I, no. No? No. In fact, we were galvanized. The more that he used these, all of these underhanded... <laughs> The more that he used these underhanded tactics, the more determined we were. We said, like, listen, we can't let, you know, the more that he did the bullying and the threatening and the intimidation, the more convinced and, and, and just certain we were that we had to, we just had to get to the finish line. We had to publish the story. <laughs> and so you've, you published it. And it had a huge uh, explosive quality after that, you know. And one of the, the things was Woody Allen writing in the New York Times, uh, an essay about a witch hunt that was on its way. Mm. Your reporting and the subsequently uh, exploding of the Me Too. Mm -hmm. In how far did it get a witch hunt? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, one thing's for sure, which is that we did not have any, we, we had no clue what was coming. I mean, we suspected that Weinstein was going to Basically, I suspected that he was going to be ousted from his company. I didn't think that he'd survive. But in terms of what the broader impact of the story was, we certainly never imagined that the story would help fuel and ignite this Me Too movement, the hashtag that had been started by Tarana Burke in 2006. In fact, two nights before the story was published, Jody and I had been working around the clock in the middle of this insane 48-hour period. And it was about one o'clock in the morning, and we said, we turned to each other and said, okay, we got it. We have to go home and get some sleep um, and come back to the office the next morning. And so we shared a cab from uh, Midtown Manhattan to Brooklyn. We live about 10 blocks from each other in Brooklyn. And in the sort of hushed silence of the cab, we finally turned to each other and said, do you think anybody's going to read this story? <laughs> We were so immersed in the story at that point. We were so completely enveloped by the reporting and, and sort of, you know, doing whack-a-mole with all of Weinstein's underhanded tactics that we hadn't really contemplated what would happen next. And so when we published that button on the publish button on um, October 5th at 1 o'clock, we kind of held our breaths and... And, and just waited to see what was going to happen next. And within, I think it was within three days, well, not only did we kind of hold our breaths, not only were we holding our breaths, we were continuing to report. I mean, we didn't, we didn't miss a beat. We went right back into reporting. What did the company know? When did it know it? Who were the other people who enabled this behavior? What, you know, what did the talent agencies know when they were sending actresses into these meetings at hotel rooms? So we continued to report. But within, I'd say, three or four days, I mean, our, our story was published on a Thursday. Weinstein was fired from his company on Sunday. Um, and within several days of that, our phones and emails were flooded with women who were coming forward with their own allegations, you know, with their own stories of abuse and ha harassment, not just against Weinstein, but from all different industries, women from all different backgrounds. And it was the first indication we had that something, if there had been signs that things were shifting up until then, th that was when we were like, oh, wow, things are really, something's really happening here. There's a real shift that's underway. And so we, you know, once again, we, our, our response to that, we almost had to do 
do like a triage system in the New York Times, we could not keep up with the tips that were flooding in. And it really became a group project across all the different departments. The business section, the culture desk, the sports desk. There were reporters pulled in from all different parts of the paper to keep up with the like, you know, with the, with this sort of tsunami of tips that were coming to, to us. And it didn't just happen at the New York Times. It happened in news organizations across the United States and, and ultimately around the world. Yeah. And so, you know, there was the journalism that took place as the Me Too movement ignited. There were also obviously people who just went straight to social media. You know, there was one night where I came home from work and flipped open my laptop and clicked on Facebook and was scrolling through and seeing for the first time my friends, my family members, you know, colleagues from uh, you know my jobs in, in the past going on, you know, doing the Me Too hashtag and sharing their own story straight onto social media. And as somebody who had worked to, to basically unearth these stories and try to pry them into the light, to see them just flooding, flooding. into the public, you know, into public view, I mean, it, you know, it brought tears to my eyes scrolling through my Facebook that night. And so um, there, was, there was no question that something unprecedented was happening. And we continued to report. And it's one of the reasons that we wrote the book. It would have been really easy for us to finish on that triumphant moment when we did press publish and the story went out and our and all of the phones started ringing at the New York Times. Um, that would have been a really sort of nice and tidy way to finish, but we really reported into the year that followed as the Me Too movement became more complicated and confusing to yeah. people and as there, you know, a backlash emerged. And there's always this, this question of proof. There is no proof. Mm -hmm. there is, how do you deal with that as a, as a, as a reporter? Mm -hmm. You kept on reporting, you wrote this book, mm -hmm. and it's all the time people, she said, people telling something, and then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe our legal system isn't working. Is that mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. you... Well, I think that there's no question that journalism, that, that the sort of the Me Too was an example of journalism stepping in where other institutions had failed. Yeah. I mean, Harvey Weinstein came to the, you know, came to the attention of police. He came to the attention of the board of his company. He came to the attention of the HR department. Um, he came to the attention of the criminal justice system. And none of, they did nothing. They, they didn't do anything to stop him. And so... But one I, has the idea also from your book that he... he on, behalf, on his behalf, the police was bought off, or something happened, or mm. people higher up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This. Listen. This ultimately. This. Right. This. This ultimately became the Harvey Weinstein story. Is ultimately an X-ray into abuse of power yeah. and how all of the high-priced lawyers, the private investigators, and secret settlements and other tools that are at the disposal of the powerful when they want to cover up misconduct. Yes. And so there's, there's this, that's, you know, this, that's why the, it's also a story that demands broader change beyond sort of bringing one person to justice. I mean, I think what we're looking at, we really, you know, with that first story, we had been able to connect some of the dots. And in reporting this book, we had really been able to bring together so many other pieces of the puzzle, the machinery that was in place to silence women, the individuals and institutions who became complicit in abuse. And those are questions that extend way beyond Weinstein into all of our workplaces, into all of our families, into all of our, I mean, there, there, there were really sort of systemic issues and cultural issues here that went so far beyond Weinstein. Thank you. Megan Tuohy, the co-author of She Said, in conversation with the Dutch journalist Joyce Rodnot at the University of Amsterdam back in 2019. Did you know that you can go to our website, john-adams.nl slash videos, where there's a link to the video of this extraordinary event. We also have a newsletter you can sign up for and a veritable treasure trove of great American thinkers and speakers at john-adams.nl. And while you're there, why not become a member of the John Adams? Not only will you support what we do, you get a discount to future live events. In the meantime, you should go to wherever you get your podcasts and leave a review of this show. This will help get the word out and we can keep on sharing the very best of American thinkers in Europe with you, free of charge. That's it for this week's show. Our theme song is called La Prensa by the Parlandos. Our editor is Tracy Metz. From Amsterdam, this was Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute. I'm Jonathan Goubert. 
Thank you for listening.